Just a reminder to our Speculating Wildly About Crime listeners, this is for entertainment purposes only and solely the thoughts and opinions of our team. We do invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Welcome to Speculating Wildly About Crime. I will be your host today. My name is Jamie. We are going to be covering the tragic yet mysterious case of Rebecca Zahau. This is a a case that takes place in Coronado Island, California. And some of my main sources for this was a four-part documentary of Murder at the Mansion. This was an amazing documentary. I also really loved how they went Catherine Zellner style and they recreated some of the crime scenes. And it was just a really great documentary. I will also listen to a few podcasts called Moms and Mystery, Red Handed, as well as a true crime creepers. Rebecca Zahau was originally from Burma. Her family ended up moving to the U.S. in 2007. Before coming to the States, Rebecca had gotten married to a man in 2002. Rebecca was somebody who was a fitness buff. She was all about her career. She went into ophthalmology, and she was just a highly sought-after career woman who was gorgeous beyond gorgeous. Sadly, her marriage from 2002 didn't work out, and Rebecca and this man got divorced in 2011. She had moved to Arizona, and in 2008, Rebecca met a man by the name of Jonah Shacknai, and he was immediately smitten with her. Before I dive deeper into their history, you all heard me say 2011 and 2008. You can do the math. Yes, she was still married at the time that she met Jonah. There's a little bit of controversy that goes into that. But they did immediately fall in love. They moved in together shortly after that. Jonah was a self-made millionaire. He was the CEO of a pharmaceutical company called Medesis. He had this house in Arizona, but then he also had a vacation home out in Coronado Island, California. And when I say vacation home, this was a gigantic mansion, 10 bedrooms, 27 rooms, beautiful with a guest house. Jonah did at one point ask Rebecca to quit her job and just be that housewife, which was important to him because Jonah had two previous marriages. He had two older kids with his first wife. And then he also had a six-year-old son by the name of Max with his most recent ex-wife, Dina. So it was really important for Jonah, for Rebecca to be that stay-at-home mom so that he had somebody who was constantly there to take care of Max. As you can imagine, the life of a CEO is super busy. So he wanted to make sure that there was a sense of family around. Everybody described their relationship as being that fairy tale, Cinderella story. They were so in love. Everything in their life was so great until the days in question. So we're going to fast forward to July of 2011. Jonah and Rebecca at that time had been together for about two years. At this time, Max is six years old and they were living in their summer home, which was a beautiful mansion in California. It was on an island right outside of San Diego. We are going to start with July 11th, 2011. On this day, uh, Jonah was running some errands for his company. He had to go to the gym. Rebecca was at home with Max and their dog, Ocean, and Rebecca's younger sister, Zena. Rebecca was using the bathroom and she heard a huge crash. She comes running out to see what happened and made the very unfortunate discovery of Max's body lying on the ground of the first floor of their mansion. To paint the picture of what this house looked like so that you can understand how something like this could happen, picture any huge mansion that you've ever seen, or if you watch Real Housewives, any of those big mansions that you walk into and there's a huge staircase and the ceilings go all the way up to the top and there's a balcony from the staircase that you can see. I have something 
on a very small scale in my house and I am constantly terrified of something going over the balcony. Max was found on the first floor with his scooter next to him and the chandelier um, to the side of him. They say that it was a tragic accident where he went over the railing with his scooter. This accident and later to be death because Max unfortunately did not make it is super important to know about when we're talking about Rebecca's death as well. Rebecca did immediately call 911. You can hear a little bit in her 911 call her saying, I think he's dead in the background. And some reports say this happened. Some reports don't say this happened. So I can't tell 100% if it's true, but it was stated in some sources that Rebecca said that Max's last word was the word ocean. And some speculate that, oh, they lived on Ocean Boulevard. Oh, they live close to the ocean. But also their family's dog's name was Ocean. Some could speculate that Maybe Ocean got in the way of however he was playing and was maybe the cause of why he fell over the banister. Jonah gets home just in time to see the ambulance riding away with Max to the hospital. He immediately goes to the hospital and is there for several days. Obviously, everybody's super distraught. And Rebecca's sister was there with her at the time. And she decided that hey, this probably isn't the best time for my sister to be here. Jonah's family is going to start coming in. They decided to have Rebecca's sister go back home. Prior to this, Max's mother was called so she could come to the hospital and be with him right away. And then Dina called her twin sister, Nina, to also be with her. At this time, Adam, Nina, and Dina were at the hospital Rebecca had to drive her sister Zena to the airport. And at the same time that she was driving to the airport, she was going to pick up Jonah's brother, Adam. Adam lives in Memphis, Tennessee. He was a tugboat captain. They came home from the airport and Adam, Jonah, and Rebecca had dinner together. After the dinner, Jonah went back to the hospital to be by Max's bedside and Adam and Rebecca drove back to the mansion together. They got back to the mansion at about eight o'clock that night. Adam was staying in the guest house, so he went and did his thing there. They exchanged pleasantries, and they went to bed for the night. Rebecca was also responsible for bringing Nina back from the airport, which was Dina's sister, and Nina did state that Rebecca was not very forthcoming with her questions about what happened to Max. Rebecca is getting ready to turn in for the night, but before she does, she has a couple phone conversations with her sister, Mary. And one of the last phone conversations they had is around 9.40 p.m. that night. And she had been talking to her sister, obviously, about how distraught she was about Max's accident. But in addition to that, she had said a couple times, Dina is going to kill me. I was the one who was here while Max had his accident. They also made light of some of the conversation and talked a little bit about their father's 80th birthday coming up and how Rebecca was planning to come home to be with her father for the upcoming birthday. So they hung up the phone around 1040. But The last known phone call that she made on her phone was at 1240, and it was her calling her own phone to listen to a voicemail. Now, that voicemail was erased, so we do not know what it said. What we do know is that Jonah stated that he called her at that time. It is heavily speculated that Jonah was calling her to say Max's condition has not improved, we don't think that he's going to make it much longer. For whatever reason, that voicemail got deleted. At 6.45 the next morning, this is July 13th, just two days after Max's accident, Adam, and again, remember, the only two people in this huge mansion are Rebecca in the main house, Adam in the guest house. Adam wakes up the next morning at 6.45, rummages around the guest house, 
cannot find any coffee. So he goes to step outside to go to the main house and doesn't make it very far until he steps outside and sees Becca's body hanging from an outside balcony. And when he sees Rebecca's body, it is nude and her legs and hands are bound. She also has a noose around her neck and she has a gag in her mouth. Adam immediately rushes to the kitchen to grab a knife. He cuts her down from her hanging and calls 911. For anybody that cannot listen to 911 calls, this is your fair warning right now to dip out for the next four minutes and 46 seconds. I want you to pay attention to some of his words that he uses in the 911 call. I also want you to pay attention to some of the inaudibles. This is right after he finds Rebecca, 6.45 in the morning, has cut her body down. Emergency, what are you reporting? Yeah, uh, I, I got a girl hung herself in the guest house of, uh, it's on Ocean Boulevard across from the hotel, same place that you came and got the kid yesterday. Okay, sir, what is the address? I'm not sure, uh, 19, I'm in mean, the back house, is 1928 something. Uh, I'm not sure. Let me call you back. Okay, sir. Is she yeah. still alive? I don't know. Okay. Uh, No, sir, I need the address. She is CP already. She came here yesterday to pick up a little boy. Okay, sir, I wasn't working yesterday. I don't know what you're you talking about. Your records. Sir, I checked all of the records yesterday. I can't find anything on Ocean Boulevard. Can you tell me what the address is? I'm looking. To cross, just start sending them towards the, toward the hotel. Okay, I understand that. I just need the exact address. I can't help you until I have the address. <laughs> Ocean Boulevard. 1043 Ocean? Okay. Yeah. Is she still alive? I don't think so. Okay. Let me get the fire department. Here, Sir, hang on. Let me get the fire department on the phone to help you, okay? Hang on just a minute.
Hey, listen to me. Help is coming right now, okay? Yes. And Petey, you're on the way? Yes, we are. Okay. And you're right there with her. Did you cut her down? Yes, I did. Okay. Just stay with me. Okay. Thoughts on that? She was on the second story? Yes. Okay. So let me share a picture really quick, and I can show you... Because I'm assuming the, he cut her down and then pulled her over the balcony. She didn't just fall. So round, right? Here is the balcony that she was hanging from. So this was their master bedroom. This is a rope that she was hanging from. And this is a little table that he used to climb up on to cut her down from this rope. I'm going to preface this by saying... 911 dispatchers have a very thankless job, a very high stress job, a very high pressure job. However, in true crime, we have heard of individual dispatchers maybe not performing their job to certain standards that the general population might have. In my personal opinion, <laughs> I had a few eyebrow raises during this 911 call to say, no, I didn't send anybody because you can't just tell me the address is, oh, don't, he just said he found a woman hanging and granted the dispatcher doesn't know it's his, what, sister-in-law, but gosh. Which, why do you refer to her as, I have a girl hung herself. Why don't you say my sister-in-law or her name? He didn't say her name till the end of the call. Jamie, how well did they know each other? Had they met multiple times before? Had they just there met? Was, there wasn't a ton hey. about that, but at a minimum, she drove him from the airport. They had a conversation on the way back from the airport. They went to dinner that night that she brought him in. But I'm assuming they were together for two years that he had known about her or had met her at at least one holiday. Um, however, I mean, he did live halfway across the country in Tennessee. They lived in Arizona most of their time. And then their summer house was in California. You would still say the same thing, wouldn't you? My sister-in-law or like her name, I would be saying their name. I wouldn't be like, I have a girl here. This is just so impersonal. Well, he like also it. referred to his nephew as you picked the up boy, a boy, boy here. He, to me, it sounded like, like he it. was in a, like a severe state of shock. I also wondered, like, why was he out of breath at the beginning of the call? What were you doing? If he had to get her down, maybe. I could this have been, like, hyperventilating. Yeah. There's that. Of just finding somebody like that. Yeah. Okay. I never thought of hyperventilating. That yeah. That, it seemed, I know you're going to take me somewhere else, but as of right now, it seemed very genuine. To like how you would act. Well, okay, this terrible comparison, but you know how like when you wake up and it's like an hour past when you woke up before you hit snooze. Mm -hmm. And what's the first thing you do, you run around your house saying, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. And you're just in a panic. Like, yeah, it's kind of like that. I don't like that seemed very like a real reaction to what he was dealing with i'll give you that <laughs> yeah i can you know i can see that now do we know if he ever did cpr yeah he was doing cpr on okay. the 911 call he said that i'm doing compressions yes. right now and that's where some of his heavy breathing came in about that's halfway through the call that's what i was thinking if he was performing cpr that's why he would be out of breath it also sounded like he was talking to somebody it mm -hmm. did, right? And he also was on the phone with 911. So he could have been feeling as though he should be narrating or doing something. It's hard because the going off what Dana said, it, the 911 operator doesn't really say much. The whole yeah. call, which is tough. She's not yeah. asking him questions. They're not having a discourse back and forth 
when he mentioned that he was doing CPR, it sounded the same as even before he mentioned it. So to me, it's not like he was doing CPR the whole time, but then all of a sudden he had the address and was yelling when you have the phone because you're talking to somebody, but you put the phone away to talk to someone else because it sounded like he was saying, fuck, are you fucking kidding me? And all of a sudden he had the address to read off, but the compressions and that, that moving sound, that pattern never stopped. That's what threw me. Originally is the Coronado police that come they realize pretty shortly that they're in over their heads. So they call in San Diego homicide. They do a thorough investigation. I'm going to put that in quotes because it goes pretty fast. I want to go through some of the crime scene photos. So this red rope that we see hanging down here is obviously where her body was attached to in the house, the other side of the rope is tied to a bedpost, which was supposed to be her anchor for her to help go over this balcony. As we're looking at these crime scene photos, I want you all to picture what Rebecca looked like. She was five foot two and about a hundred pounds. Remember, her hands are bound behind her back, her feet are bound together at the ankles. I've been on little balconies like this, just like right out like a little coffee nook kind of thing, just right outside your bedroom door. Yeah. And they're, they're not crazy strong. And granted, she might only be 100 pounds, but when it's that dead weight, would that be strong enough to hold that dead weight without there being any kind of disturbance in like the mm. wall, like the structure of the house? That is a good point, and I didn't see that come up anywhere, so I, I'm not 100% sure. Along those same lines, a lot of people talked about how far the bed should or should not have moved, so you're right. There is going to be some force that brings stuff down, and can a balcony like this hold something like that? I don't, I don't know. I did forget that it was actually tied to the bed and not the actual post itself. So maybe that bed was taken on yeah. the weight than the balcony really was. And if Janelle was saying, if she did go, say, head first over the railing, when the rope got all of its tension out, would that have hit the bed up against the side table and knocked the pictures on the side table off? Or I feel like even when you hit that tension point, yeah. there's a ruckus with so pictures on the wall. The bed moved seven inches it was seven inches away from where it would have been now put a pin in that because i'm going to bring something else up later but when the, they looked at the original crime scene the bed was seven inches from where it was originally so this is the next photo that we see obviously we can see rebecca's body laying here and this made me incredibly irate we all know that the medical examiner doesn't always come when they're supposed to. This medical examiner did not come for 12 or 13 hours later. So the police decided that this is how they should leave their body or her body until the medical examiner came. Knowing that this was a crime scene, knowing that helicopters were going to drive over this. And so this is one of the aerial shots that one of them caught as a result. So... I feel awful that she was humiliated like that after dying. So they didn't even put like the sheet. No cover. Up, nope. Nothing. She stayed like this for the whole 12 or 13 hours. This is the table that Adam brought over to cut her down. It was a little broken. He's not a huge man. Okay. Maybe he was able to steady himself on it, but some people bring up the fact that it was broken and could he really stand on it? So that was something that they talked about. So this was a shirt that was tied around her neck. This was a long sleeve shirt that was used, I believe, both as a noose as well. The red rope was also used as a, as a noose, but the shirt was mainly used as a gag. So it was tied into knots and was found stuffed inside her mouth. This is the tie that was around her neck. More complicated than any tie I could ever do. These are the ties that were around her wrists. 
Again, keep in mind when you're looking at these ties, the police, spoiler alert, at the end of this, rule this a suicide. So she did all of this by herself. So she tied her feet together. And then, then put the noose around her neck. Then gagged herself. Then tied her hands behind her back. Then hopped to the balcony and threw herself over. But Which, she, would have, she would have already had to have most of this. I don't know what the right word is. Built. So that she just had to slide her hands through. Yeah. And we are going to watch a video in a little bit because the police honed in on this tying quite a bit. And so they had somebody on one of the news channels show how easy it was to tie this knot by yourself. But this person that tied this knot by themselves didn't also have their feet bound and didn't also have a, a noose around their neck. More pictures of the knots around her hands. And now we're going to the ones around her feet. They did also make a lot of note of how dirty the bottom of her feet were. It's crazy that her feet was, were so dirty. And she hung herself from the balcony. So it's not like her feet hit the ground. I don't imagine that when Adam cut her that her feet were dragging through the grass. She maybe was barefoot if she did this going to the garage to get the rope because this rope was found in the house. My feet wouldn't get that dirty going to my garage. So I can't imagine that hers would either. And I think there would be evidence of that, right? If she had been in bed prior with dirty feet, your sheets are going to show that there would be some kind of tracking on. Right. Is some and of there that were... too, or is it all dirt? The Everything I read said that it was dirt. Huh. And not bruising. And there were, to your point, no footprints found in the house, like in the carpet, in the bed, anything like that. That's now, like I will say they did a very fast investigation. So could some of that have been missed? Maybe. Well, that's just an extreme amount of dirt. To me, it looks like her feet got dragged through the yard or something, right? But I'm just even thinking about in the summertime, I like to go outside in my garden barefoot mm -hmm. and my feet don't get that dirty. They don't look great, but I'm just looking at the ball of her feet and they look black. Maybe it's just lotting or whatever, but if you look at the bottom of her feet, like I can tell that's dirt. But if you look at like the starting at the top of her feet and the round of it, those look like bruises. Am I wrong? So... They did an investigation of her body and they didn't note any bruises on her body. The one thing that they did note were some scratches and scrapes on her back and her hyo hyoid bone was broken. This is a crime scene in the bedroom. So this is where the rope was tied to the bedpost. There were two knives found in this room. A couple things I want to note about this. So again, we already talked about the bed, but I do want to reiterate, this is where the rope was tied to the bed. All of her weight would have pushed this bed. Again, the bed moved seven inches. These two knives, one of these knives had blood all in the crevices and only on the handle of it not on the blade side but only on the handle of it found it was rebecca's blood and it was all in the crevices a lot of people speculated that could have meant that there was a sexual assault that happened because it was noted that rebecca was on her period at the time that she died these paintbrushes are going to come into play in just a moment here there were a couple of drops of blood that were found that were Rebecca's. And then there was a bunch of this black paint that was found. And I promise we're getting to that eventually. Not really much to note here other than there is this tube of black paint, which again, really leading up to this thing, shows how thick the rope was. This is showing the knife. Now there was some blood found on the other end of this knife. The larger knife is the one that had the blood in all the crevices. This had blood on this, the blade edge, the serrated edge, 
this blood was found to be Rebecca's blood as well. So this was a very interesting part to me. So this is where a lot of the black paint comes into play. There was a message on this door that said, she saved him. Can you save her? I don't know what this means. It, nothing ever spelled this out 100%. There's a lot of speculation out there saying Rebecca saved him. So when Rebecca found Max on the first floor after he had his accident, she immediately started doing CPR. And Rebecca actually saved him for a couple of days. I don't want to say saved his life because he did ultimately die six days after his accident, unfortunately. But Rebecca did CPR enough to get him to the hospital for him to be on those machines to see what they could do. So maybe that's where the she saved him came from. The can you save her? Nobody could really speculate as to why that was there. If she did die by suicide, she then painted this note on the door of the bedroom while she was naked before she then went and bound herself. Number one, sounds fishy to me. Number two, they did measurements of this door. And I don't know about any of you, but if I go to write on a whiteboard or if I'm going to paint on something... I'm always going to do it at maybe my eye height, maybe my shoulder height, because that's what's comfortable to me. But this was found to be at a height of, I want to say five, seven, five, eight. So this was taller than she was. So she, not saying that she couldn't have reached, because definitely her hand could have reached above her body to get to that height. And it also slants upwards. If you're short, if you're five inches shorter than what you're writing at, in theory, towards the end of the the line, wouldn't it start to go downward as your arm's getting a little tired? They said this didn't really compare to her handwriting because, to Dana's point, her handwriting ultimately slanted to the right and down. And they also did a handwriting analysis of Adam, his handwriting match more to this where it pointed to the right and left but yeah there there was some definite analysis done on this one being the height one being their writing styles and this didn't necessarily match up to her now again the argument could be well she wanted to die by suicide so she didn't want it to look like it was her handwriting she wanted it to be cryptic for whatever reason it says she saved him. Can you save her? So we're not mentioning names, which reminds me of the 911 call when it's, we found a boy, there's this girl. I feel like if she's going to do it, would she not say, can you save me? Or I saved him. To me, that's brilliant. And I listened to a lot of shit and nobody came up with that. This is the balcony again that she would have to go over. They are saying that somewhere on this patio, they pulled her footprints. Maybe here, mm. maybe here, but she lived here. That doesn't have to be from that day. There was a little bit of blood that was found there. Again, she was menstruating. If she's nude, she doesn't have any protections. And again, the footprints and a spot of blood. And then this is the entire picture of the mansion. Uh, this is the main house here. This is where the balcony section was, and this was a guest house. So Adam comes out of this house, walks to the courtyard, sees her body hanging, cuts it down. Those are the crime scene photos. I do want to talk a little bit about two eyewitnesses that they found. So there was one woman that came forward. She lived about two houses down from this mansion, and she had stated that she heard a lot of loud music coming from that house that night. And around 1130 p.m., she heard a woman screaming, help me. She said it sounded like it was coming from high up. This interview happened six years after the death during the civil case. So that was one. Actually, they called that an ear witness. 
because she didn't see anything. She only heard. And you said that she got off the phone at 11 or 1040. About 1040. Yep. Um, and she called her own voicemail at about 1240, 1230, 1240. Or we don't know if that was her, right? I guess we don't. You're very, yeah. But somebody used her cell phone to call itself to check a voicemail. Janelle. I actually do have a question about that, though, because you said that it was erased, but are things ever really erased? Wouldn't the cell phone, cell phone provider be able to still pull the record? Apparently not in this case, because that was a frustration that every single podcast I listened to had. Nobody could pull that call. Another thing on the voicemail, it's commonly thought that it was from Jonah to say that Max had taken a turn, right? Right. So wouldn't your first response be, I need to get to the hospital? And she had talked to her sister earlier that night before this voicemail came through about how she was going to get up early the next day because she wanted to go to the hospital to bring Jonah new clothes and maybe at this point now go say her goodbyes to Max. Yeah, that would be my initial thought. I'm going to go to the hospital. Unless it was delayed in a very non- please come here way. And that's is also his ex-wife, the mother of the child is there. He's probably not so the- thrilled with Rebecca at the moment. If it was that kind of voicemail, if you are trying to go the suicide route, but that could be the type of phone call that could lead you to that distraught place. So a couple other things I want to take note of before we go into reasons for suicide, reasons against suicide, and then suspects. Two other things with the investigations. There was also an eyewitness that night who was riding his bike by the house right around 10 p.m. He stopped his bike in front of the mansion for whatever reason, and he saw some movement in front of the door with a woman looking in. Looks like she was almost trying to decide if she was going to go in the house or not. He had said that the woman had dark hair, There was also one thing I want to put out there. One of the old police captains of the San Diego Police Department was interviewed in the documentary that I watched. And he had said, he was asked, do you think those police went in there with some preconceived notions of a suicide? And he said, absolutely. They were just at the house two days earlier. The 911 call stated that somebody hung themselves. So they absolutely went in there with those preconceived notions and had that in the back of their minds the entire time they were doing the investigation. So I thought that was super important to note as well. Wanted to talk a little bit about why people thought it was suicide versus why people thought it was not suicide. And then I want to get into some of the suspects. For the people that believe she did die by suicide, The ties that were used on her feet and hands were from material that was found in the house. The brother immediately reported that's how she died before anyone else saw the body. So the arguments for her dying by suicide. Number one, there was no DNA on the rope. And I want you all to think about that. Adam cut her down and they found no DNA on the rope. They did not see any footprints in the home or the grass. So they lead that to, there couldn't have been anybody else that came in here because we don't see any other footprints. And then the main thing for them was there was no other DNA found at all in the crime scene except for Rebecca's. There were fingerprints on the bedroom door, the door jam, the balcony, the knife, the bed leg. All of those fingerprints and DNA belong to Rebecca. Number four is there have been suicides that have happened this way. There's not a lot, but there is one or two that are out there. They also proved that it was feasible to tie this knot by yourself. And then, of course, number five, she's very distraught after Max's death. So those are the arguments to say this was a suicide. So the arguments against that, the nature of the ties 
on her feet and hands. There were not easy ties. It was not stated that Rebecca knew how to tie these ties. Adam reported that she died by suicide before anybody else came to the scene. So again, we're taking his word for it. Number three, there were two computers seized and they found a number of links about anime porn, Asian bondage porn, all kinds of things. Many people speculate that was Adam, but there are some people who say, oh, Rebecca was into bondage. That's why they were on there. Okay. The same black paint from the wall was also found on her body. Now, that could be a case for or against, but one of the places that they found black paint was around her nipples. You said that the height of it, it's not that she just brushed up against the wet paint because she, she would have literally already... had to have it on her hands. Yeah. So that was really weird. They, and then I talked about, okay, there wasn't any DNA on the rope. And we already talked about also Adam's fingerprints weren't on the rope. What the hell? And then number six was there was a 10 foot drop for her to come from the balcony to the ground. And that would have more often than not made her neck snap to, and and this whole thing is a trigger warning, but it said that it would have made her neck snap almost to the point of decapitation, but all there was a hyoid fracture and bruising around her neck, which many people say was consistent to a manual strangulation versus a hanging and death by suicide. So those were the arguments for and against suicide. And the elephant in the room that nobody's talking about, but it definitely needs to be talked about. If I am choosing to die by suicide, the last thing I'm going to do is strip down naked. Rebecca did call Jonah when Max had his accident, but Jonah texted Dina and said, hey, Max had an accident, come to the hospital. And then going along with with the text happy stuff, Adam, Jonah's brother, texted Jonah and said, hey, your girlfriend is dead. You might want to come. What? And so when Jonah found that out, so go to this whole thing, it was stated that um, Jonah immediately put his heart or his dagger to his heart and said, Asian honor, guilt, shame, saying that Rebecca felt responsible for Max's death. And so this is what her way of doing like this Asian honor killing and maybe her being nude was part of it. And yeah, there was that. What a weird response. And has anybody from Rebecca's culture been like, yep, no, that's exactly what we would do. No, not that I read of. Her sister was very adamant that this was not death by suicide. Now at the point to talk about the suspects. So number one suspect is Adam Shacknai. So obviously he was the only one who was on the property at the time that Rebecca was unalived. He stated that he was sleeping at the time of the murder or suicide. He didn't use those words. Those are my words. He was in the guest house. Again, I will point out that he was a tugboat captain and she she was bound. He stated that he and Rebecca got back to the house around 7.30 or 8, said that he went to bed around 8.30 and that when he got up in the next morning, he saw Rebecca hanging from the balcony. He went and immediately cut her down and then started doing CPR compressions. He called 911. We all listened to that 911 call a little bit earlier today. We heard a ton of inaudibles during that call. In the documentary that I watched, they took that 911 call and they sent it to a voice expert to take a deeper dive into some of the inaudibles. And there were some things that they uncovered during that. They heard him say at some points in the call, and these are quotes, one of the things that he said was, you're fucking kidding me. He later screams, fuck. Then it sounds like there's some rummaging around, 
And then at one point, they hear him say, hold her still. After that, you can hear another voice saying something to him. And then the rest of the 911 call ensues. So they did take him in to do a lie detector test. Again, I'm going to preface this with, we all know lie detector tests are not admissible in court. They shouldn't really be used. But there were a couple things that I want to talk about during his polygraph test. There was a lot of nervous action around them asking questions about if he was involved in her death or if he knew of anybody that was involved in her death. And his polygraph ultimately came back inconclusive because there were a lot of these spikes during the times where there should not have been. But then there was also some normalcy. So they basically said, hey, it's inconclusive. And I think the polygraph person came to him at one point and said, you didn't do so hot. Nobody asked him, nobody coerced him to do this, this, but he provided this information without being asked. And at one point he said, I just want everybody to know that I was masturbating to Asian bondage porn. I want to know the location of the computer. Was it in the guest house that he was staying in or was it in the main house? He went to the, the guest house and she went to the mansion. So if it was found in the main house, then he would have had to have been there doing it in that part of the house. So to answer that question on just the stuff that I read into and and things that I listened to, I want to say one of the computers was in the main house that they found some of that stuff on. And so then some of the speculation was Rebecca into this bondage along with Jonah or did somebody use her computer in that house. And when I heard the part about Adam kind of volunteering this information in his polygraph, it made me think that he was looking at that on his cell phone. And to me trying to cover his tracks of, oh shit, if they look at my cell phone, I need to explain why this bondage porn was on here. Or I need to explain if there's semen found somewhere, I need to explain why they found that. So police can clearly tell at what time a site was visited. Yeah, and there wasn't a ton of that in the police investigation. It came out as more speculation. From when they got home at 8 until she got off the phone at 1040, we know that everything was totally normal. So it wasn't like these things happen. Like, there was that gap of total everything is fine. And so that's why I'm so curious about I don't know what you call it, timestamps of when the computer sites were yeah. looked at. Yeah, and I'll I'll be the first to know. I didn't go down a deep dive of to find out when that was because there was just so much with this case. And I think there definitely is some further investigation that could be done with that. Uh, but yeah, I just think it's weird that, and again, this is probably like, jumping way too far ahead but if you got that call at 1240 and then they gave her time of death as about 3 a.m because by the time adam had saw her rigor mortis had set in so you came up with this grand scheme of how you're going to die by suicide and you executed it within two hours you painted the sign, you bound yourself, you threw yourself off the whatever. I don't know. It doesn't make sense to me. But then in that time, you also learned how to tie a fancy knot. You were like Googling or YouTubing it or something. Well, exactly. That's not something I could do on a whim. If I could, that would be my party trick. Everybody would know. <laughs> Suspect number two was Dina, which was Jonah's ex-wife. She obviously did not love Rebecca. She did not get along with Rebecca. Jonah and Dina divorced in 2009, so it was still pretty fresh. A year after they divorced, Jonah and Rebecca are together, so clearly Rebecca's the hated woman, right? Dina had a lot of questions around Max's accident, and so there was that kind of speculation that went into it. It was also stated in these investigations, but Jonah had bought Dina a house on Coronado Island. And so Dina lived close because Jonah wanted Dina to be able to see Max whenever she wanted to during the summer. 
And so Dina had a house there. Dina also knew that the back door of the mansion was always open. So she knew that she could always go into the house if needed. She also refused to comment in the documentary. She will maintain her innocence till this day. And obviously the police remember Rebecca saying Dina's going to kill me. So she seemed to have a ton of motive. But it will be stated during the civil case when a lot of this stuff was opened up. Dina was seen on the cameras at the hospital and she was there pretty much all night. She was an unlikely suspect. Another suspect was Nina, which was Dina's twin sister. I talked about earlier, she texted Rebecca that night. Rebecca did pick her up from the airport. Nina stated that they had a conversation on the way home from the airport, and she didn't feel that Rebecca was telling her the truth. We talked about how Rebecca didn't return the text to her that night. So there, we talked about the eyewitness who stated that he saw somebody outside of the house around 10 p.m. that night, and it's speculated that she was ringing the doorbell. She saw a light on in the back bedroom. She assumed that Rebecca was home, didn't want to talk to her, said that she was sleeping. So Nina did say that she did go to the house. So that's what the guy saw. And she said she saw the lights on. She didn't want to disturb anybody. So she went home or to wherever she was staying at the time. I think the person staying with her said, yeah, she slept here. Or she even said she was sleeping. It was not a solid alibi by any means. Still maintains her innocence till this day. The last suspect is obviously Jonah. The police didn't put a big emphasis on investigating him. He did have a solid alibi. He was at the hospital the entire time. He's seen going in and out of the hospital several times on the camera. A couple things that are a little weird about Jonah, and this could have something to do with the death. It could have something to do with just being a good business person, but just one year after the deaths, he sold his company for $2.6 million. There was a huge sexual harassment case that was a class action suit against Medesis, which was his company. It was a $7.2 million suit that involved 225 women that came forward and said there, there was some kind of sexual harassment that happened at the Medesis organization. So you've got this class action suit and then you're selling the business. So some people speculated that maybe he did all this to get away from everything before he was convicted or whatever it might be. It was also stated that Jonah wanted to wrap this up into a bow very quickly because a lot of people were talking about him negatively. It was affecting his business. The stocks were going down. But again, he had a pretty clean alibi. I feel like you hear that a lot with wealthy people that are like, whatever we need to do to get rid of X, Y, and Z right now, we're going to do. So to me, that doesn't seem that unrealistic. It's definitely something that a lot of people do to get their name out of the spotlight. So those were the four suspects. Rebecca's family felt that it was definitely not a death by suicide. They definitely thought there was foul play. So they pushed law enforcement and pushed law enforcement to reopen the case, reopen the case. They were finally able to have a civil lawsuit because it was, the case was closed and it was deemed death by suicide and it couldn't be reopened type of thing. So they still wanted to push for that. And so anytime a case is closed criminally, the only option you have after that is a civil case. And the cool thing about a civil case is once a case is closed criminally, you can open up all police records. Anything that they had sealed is now open and, and welcome to the liking. So... They did file a, law, a civil lawsuit, and there were a couple things I wanted to note about that. The blood on the knife was all the way down to the base of the knife. It was inside all of the crevices. So it insinuates that there was some kind of sexual assault. That's number one. Number two, the knots were very consistent to nautical knots. 
Adam was a tugboat captain. So you do the math on that. Again, Rebecca's injuries were not consistent with a nine foot drop. One of the big things to me was the knot that was tied in Rebecca's photo was di very different from the two videos of the self tie. And I want to share my screen to show you guys this. We can just see from this visual here. But on the left here, we have the way that Rebecca was found and the way that this knot was tied. We see that this knot is at the top of all of these bindings, right? But when the police showed all of these, hey, it's so easy, just come and watch me do it type of thing, every single knot that they showed, the knot was at the bottom because that was the only way you could pull it tight with your hands behind your back. So it was deemed that it was nearly impossible to have a top knot and do it yourself because every video showed that it was a bottom knot. So I just thought that was crazy. I wanted to share that. That's not the craziest thing that we'll find in this. And we'll talk about the DNA testing again. All of the DNA testing that they did was a single swab. So it was like, oh, sure, we'll grab this. Sure, we'll grab that. And now you can make an argument either way with that, right? Because you can say, well, of course, that's why they didn't find anybody else's DNA because you only did a single swab. We talked about how she had paint all over her body, on her nipples, on her fingernails. I think there were some on her thighs as well. They did a close-up of one of the paint swabs found on one of her fingernails. And they basically put it under a microscope. And if you looked at the paint pattern on her fingernail that they found, the paint pattern was in a print. And the print was very consistent to that of a leather glove, which there were leather gloves found at the crime scene, along with one latex glove that was found at the crime scene. I saw those comparisons, and I urge you to just watch the documentary just for that point. My jaw dropped on the ground, and I was like, holy shit, those patterns are the same. So all of these things stated, they ruled at the civil trial that Adam was responsible. He had to pay Rebecca's family over $600,000. So that was the ruling from that. The shittiest thing is after the civil ruling, the sheriff of San Diego released a statement announcing that he planned to take a fresh review of the case. And they did this big announcement and said, in response to a civil verdict and renewed speculations, I directed our departments to assemble a team to do a review of the case with fresh eyes. This is from Lieutenant Williams. He was assigned to the case from the homicide department. A couple things they noted. The blood that they found on the steak knife that we talked about alleged sexual assault like we had talked about. However, there was no evidence of a sexual assault during her autopsy. Everybody wanted those gloves tested, but the police stated that there was insufficient amount of human DNA for conclusion or comparisons on the gloves. And then they again talked about the footprints that were Rebecca's on the patio. So they ultimately deemed again that this death was a manner of suicide. And the last thing I will note, and then we'll go into our speculations. Rebecca's family did have her body exhumed four months after her death for another autopsy. And that person stated that he did not believe that this was a death due to hanging. He believed that it was a death due to blunt force trauma and that there were four incidences of blunt force trauma to her head. And the police came back and said that was from her head hitting the wall 
or the things around the balcony. And that's why that was last thing, because I told you I was going to come back to the bed. We talked about the bed only moving seven inches. In the documentary, I talked about how Billy Jensen and Paul Holes went Catherine Zellner style and they recreated the crime scene. One of the things that they did was they took a rope, they tied it around the bedpost, and they actually had the exact bed because Adam was like, fuck this bed, I don't want it, y'all can have it. So they had the exact bed. They put it into a room that was the same size. They had a balcony that was reconstructed to be the same size. They got a dummy that was the same size as Rebecca, reenacted the whole thing as if it would have been a suicide, and the bed moved 37 inches. Not seven, 37 inches. And they didn't just test it once. They did it several times, and it was a consistent 37 inches that the bed moved. I have now presented everything I know about this. I would love to hear questions and then theories. What was Jonah's stance in the civil trial? What's the dynamic with him and his brother? Who Jonah does not believe that she died by suicide. Also, interestingly enough, Rebecca's ex-husband also does not believe that she died by suicide. So Jonah, are you saying doesn't believe it was suicide as she was murdered or she was murdered by his brother? He didn't say what I won't, I can't really say one way or the other, but he didn't believe that it was death by suicide. Even though he originally said this Asian honor thing, he later came back and said, I don't think that's how she died. I think you're right with this one. There's just so much. It just leaves me with so many questions about all of it. Yeah. I feel like we're back at the Belvedere. Adam, he woke up at 6.45 cut her down and then they were in like that backyard area when he called Mm -hmm. 911. I'm thinking the neighbors may have been starting to wake up at that time. Did they? Nothing reported anyways that there was the only two witnesses were the woman who heard the screaming and the music the night before and the guy who rode by on the bike and saw somebody standing on the porch. Because that's just, I just would think with all that commotion that somebody would have seen something. And I also think, so from the 911 call, when we were listening to it, and even before you had gone into the voice expert going through all of that, to me, it did sound like there was another voice at one point. So I immediately going into it, I was thinking, oh, was like Rebecca alive? at during this 911 call like that's what I immediately thought but I think probably that would have been able to tell that although the medical examiner got there 13 hours late that's besides the point but it, to me it sounded like there was another voice there Same. which is why I was asking of whether any of the neighbors were awake or if they saw two people outside instead of just one person outside with Rebecca I don't know. There was some speculation that maybe Nina or Dina or both of them were there and helped him with this. That was one of the theories. And I think even one person stated that maybe they were sitting on the bed and that's why the bed didn't move when they, he threw her body over, if that was the way that it happened. So I could see them being involved if Max had already passed, but he was still alive. He was, but it was at the time that she passed, that Rebecca passed, it was stated that he was either not going to make it or if he did make it, it would be a very vegetative state and basically be no brain activity type of situation. So I guess my mind would be more focused on that than a revenge, this whole plot and learn how to tie knots and... (laughs) In my personal opinion, it's very hard for me to get on the death by suicide train, but I'm going to enjoy my island over here and I'm going with the murder on the Orient Express route where I think everybody's a little bit culpable. 
I could totally see Nina and Dina, especially sisters, hyping each other up of, I'm sure there's conversations of, can you fucking believe what Rebecca did? Yeah, you're right. She was a terrible supervisor. And you know how you can just feed off of that energy from each other. And in my mind, I could again totally see maybe Dina then went to Jonah saying, you need to handle your woman because my child is now here in the hospital and that is unacceptable. And maybe then Jonah relayed to his brother, you need to handle Rebecca. And then maybe that got lost in some sort of translation of what ended up happening and if it's possible that maybe Jonah or not Jonah, excuse me, maybe if Adam had a certain fetish tendency preference, however you want to phrase it, maybe he could have been like, I'm here anyway. And I know what I'm about to do. So maybe that could have fed into the sexual assault allegation speculation that had been put forth. And maybe that could lean into there was other people on the 911 call or even how is he getting the address and doing chest compressions on the 911 call like I believe David had mentioned so I guess maybe that's where my speculation goes on everybody's a little bit culpable in some way so I had so many thoughts for this whole thing right and I'm sure I might change my mind again I'm Definitely am against the the suicide route. I don't think she did this to herself. If you're going to do that, why would you tie yourself up and put a gag in your mouth? And not to cut you off, but I do want to put this out there for anybody that does believe that it could be death by suicide. It was stated that maybe she bound herself and gagged herself so that she wouldn't stop mid whatever. So that if her hands were tied and she was gagged, she couldn't scream for help and she couldn't cut herself free. During this whole thing, I was going back and forth between our more obvious of suspects. So Dina and then also Adam. Maybe Dina was angry. Her child's in the hospital. Maybe she had just found out the news that her son wasn't going to make it and she's pissed. You're going through the motions and she wants to take revenge on the person that she feels is responsible. The witness said that they saw a dark-haired lady, but Nina has blonde hair. Yeah, so they said they could have mixed it up because it was dark, but they looked very similar, but they did have one dark hair, one blonde hair. I was on that island for a long time. (laughs) But now, I'm more now on the Adam Island. I feel like Dina has more of a motive. Let's say Max was a complete accident, right? You're all at the hospital. You're grieving your son. Meanwhile, you're leaving him alone with her. And maybe she does fit the fetish or something that he's into. And now he has opportunity. I feel like Dina would make more sense in the way if you're going to look at it for rational reason. And then Adam, well, there's the big factor, like who ties knots, tugboat captains. So oh, he I'm- claimed that he never tied knots. As a tugboat captain. Okay. So I think <laughs> I, I'm on the Adam. I think at, I'm going with Adam. That's what I'm That's what I'm going with. I'm there with you. Carolina. I feel like I'm going to be all over the place and I'm going to try to come to some conclusion at the end of this because I have yeah. so many thoughts and I think I'm going to throw out a wild theory potentially if she were to die by suicide I just can't get with that for the ties around her hands and the ties around her feet it was an interesting point that I think someone who thinks that she may have died by suicide is that she wanted to tie her hands so she couldn't stop herself I I could see that maybe the hands but like why the feet Unless she tied herself sitting on that balcony, she would have had to hop from the room out onto the balcony and then fling herself off with the gag in her mouth, with her hands to hide behind her back. I hate that we have to talk about this, but 
the fact that she was on her period during this time and the speculation that maybe that drop of blood that was on the balcony was from her period if she was sitting on there tying all of these knots, I feel like there would be more blood than that droplet of blood on there. Now, it's very dependent, obviously, but I would assume that there would be more blood there. So I just, I feel like I can't get with the suicide. But if we're going with the theory that she the only other theory really is that somebody did this to her and she was murdered why would they tie her feet and her hands like that because I feel like they would immediately think someone would come in there and, and think all the things that we're thinking that's not why would she do that if she was dying by suicide if they were trying to make it look like a suicide why would they be tying her hands and her feet in that way they could have just put the rope around her neck and flung her over like she died by suicide that way. I feel like that would just add way too much speculation that this was a suicide by doing it that way. Now, the only thing I can think is if there was a sexual assault and she was tied up for the sexual assault that somebody came in and attacked her and subdued her by tying her up and she already had ligature marks or something around her wrist that maybe they felt like they needed to account for that in some way but by tying her hands behind her back and doing all of that maybe they would do that but that would take a lot of thinking on their that's part. interesting though I never thought of it that way if they were trying to cover up ligature marks that's the only thing I can think of but because I don't know if you were trying to make it look like a suicide I just don't know why you would do that that just doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but I don't know. I don't know who I feel did this necessarily with the facts we have, but here's my crazy thought, potentially. Here for it. I really think on that 911 call, to the naked ear, I feel like it sounds like there's another voice there. To me in just my own personal opinion, it sounded like a female voice, which is why I immediately thought, oh, is Rebecca alive during this? But if Adam came, he was in, if everything he's saying is true, he was at the guest house, he came out at 6.45 to go look for coffee, he found her, he caught her down, which I think if he's just coming upon the scene, he'd immediately do, caught her down. And then I liked where David went with the address. When they were asking him for the address, he didn't know the address. He knew the address of the guest house. It was a long pause of him trying to find the address. Did he go run around to the front of the house? I know we heard the sound of the breathing, but that could have been him running. What if he came upon somebody else leaving the house at that time? That there was, he found somebody else there. Like I said, I think it was a female because of the way I think the voice sounded. I feel like that could explain him saying on the, what the voice analysis came back with is that, are you fucking kidding me? Like he came upon somebody that did this to her and he's, are you fucking kidding me? This is what you did. Fuck like kind of thing. And then decides to cover this up for this person. Now, if he were to do that, I would think that he would have to have a fairly close relationship with whoever he was doing that with. And I think the only other suspects that really have come up at all are Dina or Nina, if we're going with the fact that it's a female route. So I would be interested to know what his level of relationship was with either mm -hmm. one of them. So there's so many questions with this, but I feel like that's my kind of crazy speculation. Do you think it's possible, Carolina, that maybe she was manually strangled and 
was unconscious but had not passed away and maybe she was tied and strangled off the balcony or hung off the balcony as a this should do it i'm that's so crass to say i think that's definitely possible that was talked about in one of the podcasts i listened to where they had said maybe they did all this and they wanted to like make sure yeah because i wonder like how accurate they were able to deem her time of death because it took so long for them to arrive and all that so I don't know and it it even feels like with that with like her actual cause of death with it being could it be blunt force trauma could it be hanging could it be the manual strangulation there's so much question of exactly what caused her death too I don't like the suicide thing at all I feel like In a lot of cases, when people do make the decision to end their lives, especially when there's guilt factors into it of, I was responsible for this child, this person that I love, this family that I love is already going through a chaotic mess. Are you going to unalive yourself in such a way that's going to add to their trauma? So I did a little bit of a Google search, tugboaters in Memphis average 18 to 48 dollars an hour you're making a hundred thousand dollars a year so you have this millionaire brother who has a gorgeous wife who has guest house and money and you're not in that same financial range could there have been a possibility of him thinking the house is going to be empty everyone's going to be at the hospital i can set up a robbery i can have someone that i know come in take the save, take the valuables. And Rebecca ended up still being there. She startles the person burglaring. Their plan is not to kill her, but then they do kill her. And then they want to make it look like a suicide. I don't see how Nina or Dina or any of those with the time range playing a factor in this, but he would have had time to plan when either she ended up dead or knocked out they run over to the guest house and get him and they're like shit went wrong and now we've got to cover this up because i also looked even though he might not be the one tying knots the captain still has to know how to do it and it's taught that in school but he has to know how to do it so you're saying he staged the robbery because he wasn't as rich as jonah and he's he's not going to miss these few things So I can steal them and I can make money off of them because it's a perfect opportunity because nobody else is here. And the only reason I'm thinking someone else is because I think all of us have said we felt like there was a voice in the background. Because I did have the idea too, with this crime scene being so public with what happened to the little boy. Here's this wealthy family. Obviously they're at the hospital. Someone else breaks in that's not connected to Adam and it goes bad. But then I felt like Adam still had to play some kind of role in it. Maybe Adam was thinking that Rebecca was going to be at the hospital or it's something like that. And this has already been planned and it's already all set into motion. And then she's there. Yeah. And so weren't they together earlier in the night and then they split off and he went to the guest house and she went to the main house? They did get to the house together at 8 p.m. and he went to the guest house and she stayed at the main house. Yeah. And mm-hmm. they did go to dinner earlier that night, but nothing was reported as to what their conversation was in the car from the airport or to the house. So maybe she could have said, I'm going to go back to the hospital or whatever. Jamie, the police know anything being a mess in the house? any drawers being pulled out or anything, or they might not have even considered that. Yeah, they didn't do a super thorough investigation, but nothing came out at them as far as that went. I have two questions to start with. You said that Adam had a girlfriend at the time. Did she ever come out and say anything about him or maybe fetishes? Nothing that I read or heard about. Okay, so then second question is, can you add any more color to the relationship that the brothers had? 
I would assume if he is coming out pretty immediately, then they were really close. Yeah, nothing stated that they were like best friends or not, but I did hear a couple times that he was the black sheep of the family, if you will. So that's what I was thinking that it could have been almost like a jealousy situation where you have a CEO and a tugboat captain, very different tiers in life. But then, David, I thought your speculation was really interesting. However, so this was their summer house. So if he wanted to rob it, like he had a whole lot of months out of the year to have this robbery scenario play out. And it doesn't sound like he had a whole lot of time. This wasn't just like in his back. If anything happens to one of his kids, I will kick this off. It seems like he left pretty quickly after all this happened with Max. It wasn't like Ocean's Eleven style, we're going to plan this out for months and then go execute this. It was, he got the phone call and left Tennessee within a day or something, right? And not that this has anything to do with it, but like all the questions about how Rebecca was vague about answering questions, she didn't see what actually happened. I don't think that's strange at all. I'm sure she would love to be able to answer those questions, but she didn't see it and she couldn't ask Max what happened. I think they speculated that, so Dina asked him to reopen the case for Max and they did. And there was one investigator that said, oh, it looks like he had injuries that were sustained before he had his fall type of thing. And so then there was some speculation, did she hurt him before he fell and then put him down there to make it look like that's what happened. But there just wasn't a lot of salt in that because of the relationship that they did have and the fact that her sister was there. I always thought that it was something with the dog slash scooter accident and then he grabbed on to the chandelier when he went over the balcony. So here's what I personally think happened to him because again, I have a 10th version of what this house was and I'm terrified. Like when I walk in my hallway upstairs, I try to walk to the other side of the hallway because it's very easy for me to trip over something. And if I'm holding Chloe, she could easily fall over the balcony. So my balcony, for example, has a railing that's probably about this wide. So if I'm six years old, I'm looking at that and I will note the upstairs was carpeted. So a lot of people said, oh, he was going too fast on his scooter in the hallway and he tripped. The investigator said that he couldn't have because there was plush carpeting and he went to gain that speed. So my thought is that, again, my balcony is like this. So he, as a six-year-old, probably thought, how cool would it be if I could ride my scooter on the top of that, right? And somehow got himself up there and tried to do that. And of course, we all as adults know you you can't do that. And that's what happened. That's just my thoughts on what happened to Max. Yeah. As for Rebecca, I definitely don't think it was a suicide. I could be on board with it was just a stranger intruder they maybe knew what happened to max and so assumed that everybody would be out but it's just too coincidental for with the knots i think the thing that is bugging me so much is that time window of the eight o'clock got home to 10 40 or talking to sister like everything is totally normal and this is this is a weird one yeah this one's really hard Especially like given the, the timing and the circumstances surrounding it with Max and what happened to him. And it's hard to believe because like I feel like I was thinking, oh, could it be a stranger that came in and did this? But like you said, Janelle, the timing is just so coincidental with all of the events that are occurring. That's why I was so curious about how in the civil trial, like what Jonah, his vibes 
towards his brother mm-hmm. and wonder if they have a relationship today or if they do, what is that like? And gosh, could you imagine losing two people? You're already at the rock bottom of your grief level. And then you're like, that was not the bottom. Could it be somebody that was obsessed with Jonah and figured out that this happened and then came in and did this thing to Rebecca because they're deeming her responsible or something. I don't know. Or what if she had like a stalker situation and just didn't say anything about it or when somebody just, it was like a crime of opportunity because Jonah was at the hospital. I feel like there has been like some kind of study where the tiniest percent of people commit suicide nude. Yes, it was on either the documentary or a podcast I listened to where it was like less than 5% of people who die by suicide were nude. So two theories, semi make sense, immediate want to go there theory is that Adam did come home with Rebecca. He did go to the guest house. He did have a conversation with his girlfriend and he was like, okay, let me look at this porn. My brother's distraught. She's distraught. Maybe I can put in some guilt sex thing. So went over there, tried to make an advance to her and she said no. And he was like, I don't take no for an answer actually. And strangled her. And whether he sexually assaulted her with the knife before or after, I know the police said there was no, but I invite you all to take a dive down this case and you'll be like, there's no way that she wasn't sexually assaulted with that knife when you take a dive down this case. So whether he did that while she was alive or dead, I don't know. Part of me thinks maybe it was while she was alive because you remember that her blood was on the blade end of one of those knives. So maybe if she was sexually assaulted, she was trying to take it out and got cut with that somehow. And that, cut was not put on the police report for some reason so my thought is that he did that with her things went too far shit now she's dead okay I have to make this look like something tried to make it look like a suicide the best he could hey I know how to tie knots because I'm a tugboat captain I'll do all these things right and then I'm going to come out the next morning He did say that when he went to go to bed that night, he took an Ambien. So maybe he tripped out. Maybe he took too much. So my immediate thought is that he did all of that. And the reason that there are no fingerprints is because he wore gloves the whole time. I don't know why nobody talked about that or said that or anything during any of the investigations. Of course, that's why there's none of that. He clearly painted the thing on the door. It was at his height. And he tried to make it cryptic to make to throw everybody off. And he didn't want to make it sound too much like anything. And then the 911 call for me was very theatrical. Again, I've never been in that situation. So I don't know what I would sound like. So that's like my number one go down this theory. That's what happened. He had this fetish. It went wrong. He tried to make it look like whatever it was to cover it up so that he didn't get in trouble with his brother or get in trouble and go to jail. My crazy off the wall theory is some people had said that the accident that Max had was maybe not an accident. So my thought was Jonah was pretty quick to sell this company. He had this sexual assault thing that was going on. What if somebody was coming after him? Or what if he knew that this person was a kingpin in the sexual assault case and they said you better be quiet or else and he's no I'm gonna go tell somebody and he's cool then I'm gonna kill your son and he's I'm still gonna go to somebody cool I'm gonna kill your girlfriend and he's okay fine I'll shut the fuck up now you've killed all these people in my life because that was another theory that came up and I know we had talked a little bit about maybe a stranger came in but my stranger motive for me is has to do something with the company because I think it was all too perfect how He sold the company shortly after all this happened and after the sexual assault class action suit came. I just, I I will go back to my police corruption a little bit and the fact of, I think there 
is power. There's something to be said about somebody in power and you just listen to them. So those are my thoughts. You said that they were only away from Max for how long it takes to like go to the bathroom or. Right. But the house is huge. What if they were like hiding out? Maybe you just took the first opportunity that came to them. But if you're so terrified that you're going to go to jail and your life is going to be ruined, I think you spiral into the point of whatever I can do to make it not happen. My first go-to theory is Adam had a weird sexual thing. It didn't work out well. He staged the whole thing. But after I listened to my fourth podcast today and somebody said something about a stranger, I was like, holy shit, it could be for both instances. Because remember, they did reopen the case of Max's death as well. This one, I think, has now just hit one of my top cases if I just want to know the answer. Technically, the case is solved, but obviously we learned tonight that there's definitely still a lot to talk about. So until we know the exact answers, all we can do is speculate wildly. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our show today. We ask you to please subscribe to us on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else that you find your favorite podcasts, just so you don't miss out on any of our episodes. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at SWACPOD, S-W-A-C-P-O-D, or you can contact us via email for questions, comments, or case ideas. Our email address is SWACPOD at gmail.com, that's S W A C. P-O-D at gmail.com. Thanks so much for speculating wildly with us tonight.